we talked about the evolution through geopolitical dynamics, the realignment of markets into three regional economies. The three regional economies actually will be doing more trade and investment or the 10 flows that I talked about within the block than between the blocks, which is going to create enormous restructuring of the world economy. For example, Europe and America were highly together in their economic growth and you know, investment, etc. We see that disconnecting more and more where America begins to invest more into Central and Latin America, for example. Europe begins to invest more into Eastern European countries, and that's a very different alignment. There are certain exceptions to this, as we mentioned, four economies, which will become world magnets. China is the one the right now. India is the second one. Uh, Russia is the third one. Fourth one is Brazil, where clearly China and India will be targeted as world markets. Everybody will race there at the same time, although politically they will be more aligned within those blocks by and large. Just keep in the back of your mind. How does all this impact markets? Well, first of all, it requires completely realignment of markets, as you can see in the chart. And the word realignment of the markets by this geopolitical process, there are four areas that I will talk about. First one has to do with industrial policies of the nations as they become a part of a larger market, a regional market. Second one I'll talk about would be national infrastructure. In other words, economic infrastructure, uh, physical infrastructure, information infrastructure, how that will be changing. Third one has to do with the domestic policy. What will be the domestic policies about domestic industries by and large? Which industries they will encourage, incentivize? Which industries they will let go? And the last one has to do with international trade, how the trade will change, as we mentioned earlier, more within the block than between the blocks. And we will get into some details of those four. So that's where I would like to go now. And let's just start, therefore, with the industrial policy. The first major impact is going to be that all those nations who are a part of the block, clearly, the ideology will be put in the back burner. Ideology will not drive the politics, but the markets will drive the politics. In this case, regional markets by and large. So with whether these are the Eastern European countries, eventually Russia, whether these are the Latin and Central American countries, eventually Brazil, same thing on the Asia side, China, for example. China is already starting, in fact, with the economic and the market journey as opposed to an ideology journey by and large. But that will be the key driver. So any country that still holds on to ideology will not get integrated very quickly. And this is the debate most likely to happen in the Middle East. In the Middle East, you have the monarchy structure, first of all. There are no democracies in place. Secondly, they are not necessarily market-driven economies. Those are small states, especially United Arab Emirates, they are very getting smart, like Dubai we talked about, for example, you know, and Bahrain, another one, you know, those are the kinds of countries, small ones, with their autonomy are becoming more and more secular, more and more market-driven, more and more capitalistic, although democracy may not come. So the Middle East reform, surprisingly, is going to be less on the democratic front and more on the economic and market front is our forecast as it is happening in China, as it is happening in India, as it is happening among all the emerging nations by and large. That will be the one key thing. The other major very key change is the privatization of public enterprises. All of the communist bloc countries had very large enterprises, but they were government owned, government invested, government managed. This is the biggest change that's going to impact businesses in the following way. Comparing China with India, China had nothing but public sector enterprise as a communist country. There was no private ownership allowed. Therefore, China was able to get into scale very fast. So you, many of the Chinese state enterprises, which are now becoming more and more market driven, are also becoming global enterprises at the same time. So the next wave of global enterprises worldwide competing with the European, the Americans, are going to be Chinese enterprises, just like Japan became the first, then Taiwan, then Korea, 
companies like Samsung, uh, Hyundai, Kia became the world enterprises, the next wave will come from these emerging markets, especially China and to some extent India and Brazil, et cetera. But China, India, Russia are the three we are watching right now in, 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 with some interest. For example, in the appliances business, out of nowhere, a company called Hire, H-A-I-E-R, is the second largest appliance maker, which is a Chinese company. And now they're saying we would like to be a global enterprise. Why just rely on the Chinese domestic market? China is the largest consumer electronics manufacturer in the world. You will see brand names. Hire also is in consumer electronics, as it is in white goods or the appliances. In uh, information technology, ICT, information communication technology, the telephone companies, the routers and the servers. So the companies like Cisco, IBM, Dell to some extent, uh, but Alcatel, Lucent, Nortel are all going uh, impacted by a company called Huawei. Huawei is a electronics, industrial electronics manufacturer, is now flexing its muscles. It is able to compete against all these world-class companies. You saw what happened in the PC business. IBM found that PC business at the assembly level is a low value add. In fact, an industry study done of IBM, Compaq, and Hewlett Packard when Compaq was independent company showed that these three largest PC makers were only adding 11% value in their factory. 89% was all procurement, out of which 79% went to Intel and Microsoft. So guess who is making money? You are a slave manufacturer. Your suppliers are making money, one of you. IBM finally decided there is no worthwhile business. PC business is not, they should be, so they sold it to a company. And I used to forecast about this company as the largest single PC maker in the world, a brand name called Legend, which will surpass Dell computers. That is now called De Novo, because Legend name is used in America by other companies. For example, Acura has a legend brand of automobile, and there are other legend names. So there are copyright trademark issues. So they've changed the name of the company called Denovo. They are going to buy out IBM. And worldwide, their market share will rise with the power of the domestic market. Just like Japanese got the power of the domestic market after World War II in consumer electronics, in machine tools, in automobile, and then they went to global. It's the same architecture I see out of China. So we must watch China enterprises, which are all public state enterprises. Chinese banks, for example. Chinese electronic manufacturers. China will dominate worldwide through more and more branded goods as opposed to unbranded private label they make for American companies now. Fundamental shift in the policy. Very important to realize. And we see the same thing happening out of India. In fact, India, both the private sector, as they are called, or uh, privately held, I mean, they're public uh, state, uh, which is stock market oriented companies, uh, as opposed to government enterprises. All of them are now trying to become global enterprises, and they will take the markets away from other countries. You saw the first major sign of this one through the private enterprise system is a gentleman by the name of Mittal, M-I-T-T-A-L. Lakshmi Mittal is his name. Lakshmi Mittal became a consolidator based in UK of Indian origin and has become the single largest steel company in the world now. His own net worth now is, has risen. It's an all paper net worth, but based on Forbes' latest analysis, he is now the third richest man in the world right after Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. $25 billion of net worth by buying out steel companies. He got his first break out of the Eastern European countries after the collapse of communism. State enterprises had no money, so they began to sell the steel company assets, which are government owned. He began to accumulate them, turn them around, made them into profitable because these are government run, and therefore they were inefficient by definition. It was very easy to do, and then he began to acquire large steel companies all over the world, including Inland Steel, fourth or the fifth largest steel company in America. You will see that journey. So the next wave of enterprises will come from those state enterprises from these large emerging economies who are actually, in fact, going to be world enterprises. We already seen, by the way, just as an example, uh, Mexico. Cemex in the cement industry is already the third or the second largest cement company. So cement industry, again, the largest market for cement is India and China. 
largest market of anything. And Lafarge from France, a European company, is consolidating. CMAX is consolidating, and you will see this emergence of what is called the rule of three. In my another presentation, I have done about competition, and I've talked about how all industries, when they're allowed to compete, there are no restrictions on the industry, either by patent rights or regulated monopolies, etc. If the markets are allowed to be competitive, they're always organized into three large companies. Mid-sized companies collapse, shakeout mergers take place, and niche companies grow at the same time. So large enterprises worldwide will have come more and more from Asia as they came from Europe at one time, then America. So the 21st century belongs to the Asians, will be the argument. The emerging economies especially will also immediately put incentives for quality. So Six Sigma will become a common word there for innovation, not just quality, but creating their own R&D. So we expect, for example, countries like China and India to file more patent rights among the advanced countries more and more, and therefore the share of patents will grow out of China and India. And of course, they will third emphasize would be productivity. And these are the countries with large labor forces, but I do expect these countries to go through massive automation very fast. In other words, the labor as a human capital will not be used just for mundane work, but will be more and more automated, more and more sophisticated, and of course, these countries will invest in their education, will invest into their vocational technical training, just like what America did, in fact, uh, in the last century and uh, let's say after the Civil War. Uh, how many vocational technical training universities we created were funded by the state? New York State, California State funded all these things just as we funded the land grant universities at one time to prop up the agriculture sector. Again, a lot of automation in agriculture, a lot of scale, economy, so productivity will come that way. Employment will become very important in these countries and they will measure how many poly political parties are generating more jobs. Is it 10 million net new jobs, 20 million net new jobs? And this is where we see the country is going through industrial policy which says we will have to invest into those parts of these emerging countries where there is no employment right now. So if you look at China, it is all on the east, on the coastal lines, north to south, they're going to shift more and more employment opportunities by encouraging industries to put their factories in the interior, the western provinces. India will do the same thing from large cities, about a dozen will go into smaller and smaller towns by a public policy, essentially, to say. And by the way, this again is nothing new. That's exactly what we did in America. We had a huge landmass. Both the military installations were in small places, and also the British and the colonial powers put their factories into remote places. That's why we still have factories in very small towns quite a lot, because that's where the resources were burned out. So that's a very important thing to analyze. Employment will be the very key growth engine for these economies. And then through employment and through savings, they will eventually have more and more balance sheet or more and more wealth creation as a mechanism. Next area, which is a very key in terms of uh, uh, you know, industrial policies, that these nations will actually be more and more co-opted into global intellectual property rights. In other words, the patents, which is just one element, there are much bigger intellectual property rights in design, for example, in clever phrases and the language, you know, arts and culture, copyrights, just goes on. I just put all this into intellectual property rights. They actually will more and more obey those. Piracy will be less and less from these countries because it will be in their self-interest because more patents, more copyrighted things will come out of these economies by and large. So you're going to see that a realignment. Actually, in fact, I have this forecast that surprisingly, more piracy will take place in advanced countries of technologies invented in these emerging nations because these emerging nations are inventing technologies or discovering technologies at the bottom of the pyramid. Markets that are neglected by the advanced countries where affordability is an issue. I've seen enormous experiment going on now in rural India about cell phone technologies, wireless technologies, for example. China will do the same thing. So we think that the European and the Americans actually will imitate technologies and piracy issues will come about. 
These emerging nations will therefore not only go for property rights in pharmaceuticals, I've seen this thing surprisingly in automobile design. I don't know whether you know, but the two countries have teed up the idea that the world car for masses ought to be under $2,000. When the current norm is about seven or $8,000, one fourth the cost, both China would like to produce a car under $2,000, which is worldwide from a safety, environmental, emission, every viewpoint. India has just announced they would like to produce a world car that is under $2,000. And they're not simply saying this thing, they're likely to do it because in their own countries, they have innovated in a different way than the traditional Western technology being transferred out there. So intellectual property rights will be a major, major issue and the countries will have all kinds of geopolitical negotiations about that area. Uh, the last area is environmental compliance. We will have environmental compliance more aggressively enforced, surprisingly again on industrial nations, not on emerging nations. Emerging nations will already in fact co-opt into this area. But they will now put pressure on advanced countries to say, how much pollution are you doing? This is the Doha round, as you have heard, for example. This is the, you know, the, the, the event in Japan that took place recently where you know, there are a lot of pressures on America, a lot of pressures in Europe to abide into the new environmental policy by the government. You know? That's very key. So environmental compliance, again, will create an economic impact on the Western world a lot more so than we realized. It will not be as much on the emerging nations. The point I want to drive is that as these emerging nations become economically strong and viable with the domestic markets and a global aspiration, most of these nations will put enormous competitive pressures on advanced countries. Advanced countries will be more in the defensive rather than in the offensive, opposite of what we thought. These countries actually will be enforcing more intellectual property right and environmental compliance than the advanced countries. And that's a fundamental non-intuitive way of thinking by and large. Next area has to do with infrastructure. Again, the infrastructure is into two categories. Most advanced countries' infrastructure is aging. They have not invested in the second wave of investment, whether it's in highways, sewage systems of the world of advanced countries, for example, air pollution, environmental pollution, any kind of an infrastructure that you need by and large, including education and infrastructure, capital markets as an infrastructure, emerging nations are rising enormously. In fact, I'm told that today, everybody who goes to Shanghai suddenly realizes that they are way ahead of any city in America or in Europe. It is very much like we had the Eastern European great cities of yesteryear, Budapest, for example, in Hungary, you know, you would have cities like, you know, uh, Leningrad, you know, or whatever they call the new name now in Russia, which were plateaued by the industrial, you know, economies later on. America produced the best cities in the world, but today American cities look like more aging cities. Airports the same way. You just have to go to Asian airports, such as Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and of course, Beijing, uh, uh, Singapore. And now with the new Olympics coming into China 2008, you have seen the massive infrastructure. By the way, China is deploying more than 15 million landline access lines for telephones, which is bigger than one baby bell among the original seven baby bells annually. So IT infrastructure, physical infrastructure, ports, railways, anything that moves things around etc., and capital infrastructure, stock market exchanges, etc., you're going to see. So that's again will be a level playing field that will take place, and surprisingly the internet would be the biggest impact changing, making, which is an infrastructure also. So urgent need for information infrastructure is realized by these countries, and they will actually surpass is our forecast. They will also upgrade transportation and logistics, but that's true of all countries in the world. Seaports are aging everywhere. The next generation of seaports always are much better built, both for the container cargo as well as for the bulk cargo, especially with the use of information technology. So you have a very intelligent seaports where all of the custom clearance, all of the security thing is done automatically. So upgrades, airports and seaports, as I mentioned. 
energy real reliability will become the strategic issue. And we already see the first round of battles. All these economies will now begin to demand that we also need access to energy. So suddenly what we thought that with the change from the industrial age to the information age, the need for energy will not be as great, just the reverse is happening. Shortage of energy is enormous. So you talk now today, Indian uh, you know, economy or Indian politicians or the Chinese politicians, they're all racing worldwide to have secure energy sources. They don't have reserves. A lot of that is imported. This has a massive impact on countries like China, I mean on Japan or Korea, which has no access to energy. So energy, where we are the dominant nation as consuming nation for energy, will have to compete for energy resources on a worldwide basis. And again, the Asian bloc, which is the largest consumer of energy, still is not self-sufficient, will do disassociate its politics and military from its economic aspects, and therefore will have a comparative advantage compared to the European country and definitely America, another major event that we are watching. The next area is capital markets. Yes, we do have the largest stock exchange today, New York Stock Exchange. We do have a very large NASDAQ, the Emerging Market Stock Exchange, for example. But future again looks like that more and more massive stock exchanges will be built in the Asian capitals and will surpass even things like Tokyo Stock Exchange or, in fact, let's say Singapore Stock Exchange, Hong Kong Stock Exchange. But there will be next set of stock exchanges that we will have to watch. Of course, India is already becoming a much and much greater and greater a capital market institution where the Indian stock exchanges are booming right now as the middle stock exchanges are booming. So that's another thing that we are watching. And the financial institutions like the traditional banking business, investment banking business, private equity market, all of that will be organized in a way which says most of these industries will have an enormous revitalization compared to what we thought was going to happen with the evolution from an industrial age to a services economy to a knowledge economy by and large. Again, a non-intuitive uh, angle that I see. Next area has to do with realignment of the domestic industries. First of all, most of these countries will allow market process to say industry must consolidate domestically first to create a scale. Country like India, for example, has so many little unorganized sector family run businesses. There's no scale. India may be one of the largest consumers of, let's say, cigarettes, but there are not too many large cigarette companies. India is one of the largest consumers of luggage in the world. But if you take the branded organized market, as it is called, the top three luggage companies only produce 35% of the luggage. 65% is all unorganized, assembled, unbranded, on the street. Vendors sell luggage just as they sell shirts or garments. By the way, you think it's luggage. PC business, personal computers, the same way. More than 45, 50% of all PC sold in India is unorganized, white boxes as they are called. There is no brand. People simply assemble in a garage. That the country will realize is not economical. It's not efficient. It's not globally competitive. So they will allow more mergers and acquisitions among the banks, cements, wherever the country thinks that it has a huge domestic market advantage, a resource advantage, and therefore can aspire to become global players in the process, serve the global markets. So we see more industry consolidation taking place among the Chinese companies within China, Indian companies within India, Brazilian companies within Brazil, Turkish companies within Turkey, Mexican companies, they're all large emerging nations, the same phenomenon. Most of the industries will become regional in nature, not just national, which means they will think about Asia Pacific block they're serving. Already you see uh, Korean industries thinking more and more Asia Pacific block. Japanese industries are thinking the same way. So if they are global, they may plateau the global for a regional advantage or they dominate one region more than the other regions. And starting new companies will definitely go into the regional architecture, especially the European uh, companies. European companies are very national in character. If you look at Fiat, for example, if you look at Siemens, if you look at Alcatel, and if you look at their market shares of their products, 
the domestic market has 50-60% market share, and the neighboring uh, European Union markets, they may have 10%, 5% market shares. You will see within a region huge consolidation. More and more countries will be encouraged by the governments to have specialization. In other words, focus on those industries where you can serve the domestic market better and become regionally, if not globally, competitive. So many, many of these countries will not be saying, I want to do everything and have the markets closed. India used to be like that. So India will basically begin to focus on a few industries where it can dominate the world. I don't know whether you know, but India is already the single largest country in the world for cut diamonds, finished diamonds. It took over the Belgium, Antwerp used to be the place. It took over the Israelis as a nation or Israel as a nation and has become the largest single diamond cutter in the world. Now they're saying more and more of the same thing. How can the diamond companies brand themselves and go global as fast as possible? India is the second largest in textiles. China again is the largest textile producer and the largest textile consumer. India is the same way. So textile industry again will specialize more and more. India will specialize as a nation and go global. India is emerging as one of the largest countries for pharmaceutical industries now as an alternative to very expensive, uh, what, what they call, you know, uh, uh, big, block, big, big, you know, uh, blockbuster drugs, billion plus dollar revenue drugs. India is able to create with alternate technologies because of the affordability. India is dominating the bulk drugs primarily. It has a great set of laboratories, just goes on and on. So you will see, again, another industry that India may specialize, automotive components. So each country will decide what is my strength, not on a domestic basis, but on a regional basis and maybe global basis. And, and the country begins to specialize as Finland has done, as Sweden has done, as Netherlands is doing right now, France is doing to some extent in the European architecture. Same thing is going to happen in the Asia architecture and same thing in the America architecture by and large. In fact, in America, we are outsourcing several industries where we are not going to be regionally or globally competitive, uh, such as, for example, uh, consumer electronics, for example. Basically, we are outsourcing it. Right? So I think that's a very key area that we need to focus on. They again will emphasize productivity. Productivity will become a worldwide thing. Labor versus productivity will not be opposite to each other. How can you make labor more productive with more tools and automation kind of a thing? And that will be productivity will be done through quality and through innovation are the two major platforms. Governments will create more and more incentives or awards or recognitions for innovation and for quality. And the last one is that you will see clearly the emergence of regional standards. There will be fight for standards. Right now we see the fight for standards between GSM in cell phone and of course alternatives to GSM, mostly American standards, such as a Qualcomm CDMA standard. Just like in electricity, we had standards fights in the old days, you know, 110 voltage and uh, 60 cycle versus 220 voltage and 50 cycle. Just like we had standards fights for railroads in the old days, we are having standards fights right now in the cellular industry whether the CDMA will win the world or the GSM will win the world, we don't know, but it will be regionally dominating one standard. Some of them may rise to a global level, but you will see more and more regional standards emerge in the process, which again is non-intuitive and contrary to globalization aspects that we have been always talking about, right? The third major structural change in terms of realignment of markets has to do with international trade. Trade is the growth engine, as we talked about. In fact, if you analyze the data, since the 60s, the GDP of the advanced countries really grew through trade with the GATT, G-A-T-T, which then became a WTO, more liberal trades, less tariffs and controls. As it came into the world, the trade created the growth in the, in, the, in the national economies. So trade is going to be used, except trade, as I mentioned earlier, will be much more regional than global. Between these three regions, the trade will not be as great as within the region. So we have to watch within region and trade, mostly within a region and within the same company, intra-company, intra-firm, intra-region trade will become more interesting. 
there also will be a realignment of currency. And here are some dramatic uh, forecasts. First of all, pound will be gone as a world currency. If you look at the history, there was no currency. We basically held you know, mobile uh, wealth assets like gold and diamonds as currency equivalents. When the monarchy collapsed, most of the kings were running for their life, so they took their mobile assets with them, but then gave it for safekeeping to a person whom we call a banker today. That person issued an IU note saying that I owe you in case you are, don't show up, but your heirs come, I will actually have the trust and the integrity to have your assets given back to you, jewelry, diamond, gold, etc., when your heirs come and pick it up from me. That IU is a modern banknote, as we know, the commercial paper, which then became a central currency as the nations evolved, right? So gold was counterbalanced by pound because British became the largest trading bloc, British Commonwealth or British Empire. Then as America grew as an economic power, we created our own currency dollar, along with, of course, the Deutsche Mark, the French franc, because they're all colonial currencies, because those currencies were all divided between the British pound, the German mark, the French franc, Italian lira, whatever is appropriate, Dollar became the de facto large currency, but today euro as one single currency is becoming as big as a dollar. So the pound will be phased out. British pound will become not as an essential for central banks to hold as a reserve. Gold is gone essentially, so you need to hold other countries' uh, currencies as reserves to back up your currency. But the third one in the most radical forecast I have uh, turns out to be that Japan yen will also eclipse, like the pound. While Japanese economy was very critical, it's the second largest economy, and it was aligning with the Americans, most of the work was between the Japanese yen and the American dollar, Japanese yen and the European currencies, now euro. But going forward, I do believe that just like the rise of the dollar, the next currency worldwide, everybody will hold as a reserve, is going to be the Rinban Mi, as it is called, or the Chinese Yuan. As China begins to accumulate more hard assets, they own more euros than anybody, more American treasury bonds, etc. Eventually, Chinese currency will become the world currency. So one has to watch the emergence of Yuan. And of course, as China becomes the largest trading partner to the world, as America is currently today, Everybody will need to have Chinese currency in their central banks. It's just an obvious observation, but it is very dramatic at the same time. So people are watching about the emergence of the yuan as the next currency of the 21st century, like the emergence of dollar in the 20th century, and the emergence of the British pound in the 1800s. It's just like the European century, the American century, the Pacific century, the currency comes around the same way. We have now created World Trade Organization, WTO, to displace GATT. What World Trade Organization will become going forward is more like an arbitrator, a court of law where you go for your disputes. It will not be a market manager, market regulator. It basically says that if the countries have a problem, they have to go to some place and they do have arbitration, they have dispute resolution, etc. And that's the role of WTO that I see happening more and more. And oh, you already have seen that that's a role that are almost playing right now between the trade conflicts between Europe and America. Whether it's Airbus versus Boeing, for example, or certain standards fights, you know, as, as a protectionism created, all this stuff by and large. So it begins to look just like another United Nations agency, which is the ILO, International Labor Organization for Worldwide Labor Policies of the Countries, or WHO, which is the World Health Organization, you will see another entity, and probably WTO will become much more significant as the United Nations Agency resolving disputes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on the economic front. Next area, as we said already, is that the, the intra-regional trade will be actually protected. And especially, in fact, we'll have the domestic uh, uh, you know, specialization. So within the block, countries will specialize. So country A makes one product, country B makes another product. This is the old Kamakan model that the Soviet bloc put together. 
Soviet economic miracle would have worked if they had not been driven by ideology or supported, in fact, an anti-capitalistic force to the war. That bankrupted the nation, spent more into military than into consumer markets. But the concept is very viable because it is founded on this notion of resource-based advantage that Ricardo was the first economist to tee up, which is becoming more and more viable, more and more popular. That let a nation specialize in those industries where they have a resource advantage, whether it's a management talent, whether it's capital, whether it's technology, whether it's agriculture, whether it's animal, et cetera, et cetera. So whichever nation has more resources or unique resources will benefit in this architecture by and large. Inter-regional trade will be done for global competitiveness. In other words, we will end up, by the way, the first point I made about intra-regional trade, this, was already ha this already happened when EC92, which is the European Union, was created in 87 for a 1992 open market. Guess what? Immediately two restrictions were put. You have to have ISO 9000 certification. And of course, the European companies certified themselves first, so the rest of the world was at a competitive disadvantage. Then they also had a policy to say you have to have a 70% local content. That means that you cannot actually do all the work offshore. 70% of the value add has to come within Europe, essentially, which again gives a natural advantage to the European companies. So we will see intra-regional fights to protect a domestic industry in a given country. And we will see inter-regional trade to balance, counterbalance the global competitiveness of a given uh, region by and large. So these three regions will, like the rule of three theory, will constantly have economic wars against each other. This sounds like a positive view. Clearly, I do believe 21st century will probably be more beneficial to the society, less painful. 20th century was remarkably negative to the human values. Even though we invented so much through wars, we have also had so much of suffering. 1800s was a golden era almost. And the notion is that 21st century may actually provide with more modern values from agriculture days to uh, knowledge-based economy approach to doing things, more demo democratic processes, etc., more belief that poverty has to be eradicated as a way of creating, in fact, less of the radical elements in the society, all this stuff. So I see the 21st century as a rising century with more hopes and aspirations for people than ever before. More wealth will be created worldwide rather than in a handful of nations. More uplifting will take place. So this sounds like a very positive scenario, which I strongly believe in. But at the same time, I'm a realist. There will be some roadblocks that will come in the way. So the next chart really gets into what are the roadblocks. And I will not go into all of them in some detail because it's, that itself will be many, many hours of you know, presentation. But I will simply give you some sense about kinds of roadblocks that I see and what the governments or the markets may end up doing it. Surprisingly or not so surprisingly, the first roadblock would be domestic, private, entrenched sector. Most of these are family-run businesses. And those families will see the impact about their wealth they have created over several generations vanishing very quickly if you allow complete liberalization of your national market into a regional market. Look at the European Union. Italy was basically created by two large groups, the Fiat group and the Olivetti group. Netherlands was basically Philips group and the Shell group. Sweden was Axel Janssen group. You take the Thyssen group and the Krupp group, which are the steel makers of Germany. These are the groups which are basically family-run businesses for many years. A lot of personal wealth, just like monarchy, was passed on from generation to generation and they have a tremendous amount of political influence, access, and a control. It is not limited to emerging nations, as we think. This is true worldwide. 
whether it is done overtly, openly, such as, for example, political action committees in America, where we do actually give contributions, whether you call it a bribe or a contribution, is semantics, my view. But that's what we do. I personally like the system. Transparency of bribery is not a bad idea. Politics needs money. It's a large industry. Today, national campaigns for presidential elections in countries like America are reaching a billion dollar of expense. Plus the local elections, somebody has to fund this thing. The citizens won't pay for the right to vote, obviously. Parties don't have the money. So while you may have corruption under the table deals in many countries, why not make it transparent over the, over the table so that you know which politician got how much money from which individual or which corporation? That transparency is very necessary, in my view, to remove this first major roadblock of entrenched private sector resisting this change. And this private sector, also I can amplify, will be public sectors in some countries like China, or Russia, et cetera, where those are all public enterprises. So we need to really understand what will be the roadblock that the private capitalistic families will create in the process. So one has to create a win-win situation between those families, their wealth, which is hard-earned over time, and how do we leverage that for the wealth of the nation, for the good of the nation kind of a notion. Second major roadblock will be how do you privatize state enterprises? Because in many countries, in Europe, as well as in most of the democratic nations, public sector enterprises were created for job creation. Which is why European Union even today has not allowed privatization of railroads, for example, or telephones at one time. Three industries always gave the highest jobs. They were all labor intensive, which was railroads, telephone, and the third one was the postal system. Even today, in most of those countries, these are highly regulated, even though they're privatized, or they're completely government-owned and operated. There are PTNTs, as it is called at one time, post, telephone, and telegraph. Now you add railroads. These are massive employers of people. So these corporations, as they become more privatized, you will have a surplus of labor because they were used by politicians to provide jobs as a political payoff. through all over Europe in my analysis. Every country did that thing on the civilian job creation as opposed to military job creation. In Japan, we had the Zaibastu systems created, the same thing, lifelong job. Zaibastus are almost semi-public corporations, 11, 12 of them. The Nippon Group, the Mitsubishi Group, the Mitsui Group, the Toyota Group, they're all reformed more and more now, and therefore you have a huge surplus of employment. They are mostly uh, employing for life and underemployed in many ways. They don't have enough activity to do. So you will see that structure collapsing in Japan. You will see that structure collapsing in South Korea, which is called the Chai Bowl, that this government gave some sense of protection to the industry by insulating the domestic market by policy as it goes away you will see a complete roadblock, and therefore these countries will react. In fact, in India, for example, the privatization of the telephone industry has been a very painful process. They took two cities to privatize, Bombay and Delhi, two largest markets, went through that, but the rest of the country, there's a huge political opposition, and the power of the union and power of the employment is so strong that the parties could be toppled politically. But this is the same fear in France by the Chirac government about full-blown privatization, deregulation of uh, France Telecom, for example. Or in Italy for the Italian Telecom. It just goes on. It's the same phenomenon, in my view. I think we have exaggerated the differences between the emerging nations and the advanced countries. So that would be a major roadblock. It will require very strong political leadership to get it done and survive politically in the process. Uh, the third is an equal nightmare for the politicians. In fact, in this century, to be a political leader is no fun, is my view. It's a thankless job. The demands are so heavy on you. 
In fact, there is no one way you can orchestrate. So leadership becomes more and more critical. And the third major roadblock I see would be a huge cultural and ideological diversity. And the reason is very simple. As European Union, as an example, gets integrated, well, there will be permanent settlement of Germans in Italy, Italians in Germany, Italians in Finland, Swedes settling in Belgium, just goes on. So every nation in a region will have a minority group. This is nothing different than civil war in America in the 1800s when the North and South got integrated. Mistrust of Yankees by the Southerners and Southerners by the Yankees. We talk about that, we joke about it today, but it was real at one time. That same political and ideological diversity will rise within a region as regions go from a nation to regions. Whether it's in the Asia block, European Union block, or in fact the Americas block. We have already seen in America the tensions rise with books by uh, Samuel Huntington, latest book called Who Are We? And a strong worry that as the Hispanic population has been rising in America, it is 15% of the total population according to the last census, year 2004 census, so I think 2000 census. And it's likely to grow to 25%. The debate is that are we Europeans or are we Latinos? And this is going to become a major issue. And of course, most Latinos, whether those are Mexicans or Central you know, Americans or Latin Americans, are Catholics, as opposed to the American architecture, which was mostly Northern European, the WASP population, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, that is becoming one segment, one uh, ethnic group, essentially. And you are going to see huge debates going on, especially in a democratic nation or region, and especially, in fact, where you have an open press. If the press is not controlled and the elections are basically democratic, you're going to see more debates out in the public. And given that the cost of information technology is so cheap, today my memory chip on a little device I can store is basically free. Cost of memory chips is cheaper than paper by a long shot. Today my cell phones are so cheap. I can have a complete live television program on my cell phone today. And this, this is not even a 3G architecture, which is the next broadband architecture. As we have more and more broadband, you will see all of the news, information, entertainment out into the mobile devices, which means public is informed instantly. Remember the miracle we thought CNN created? When they were in Baghdad, remember, at the time when the Kuwait invasion took place by Iraqis? How imaginative, radical thought that was that there's a live reporter out there? Or before that one, when CBS had reporters out in the Vietnam War and the videotapes were sent and shown 24 hours later today, instantly, I have access to information. And if the information is misinformation, I may create certain anxieties. It's very dangerous, potent weapon out there in the hands of the people. So the revolutions may be created in the process. So that's the third major thing. How do the politicians through strong leadership, create a cultural and an ideological diversity contained, reduced, channeled in the positive way, so the society, as it becomes more and more integrated into the other societies worldwide or regionally, does not have counter reactions by and large. Or you might have, in fact, some setbacks from that one. Fourth area has to do with political gridlocks. And therefore, the only form of government in a democracy, there are two extremes. One, of course, is to have a complete dictatorship. Or you have a very good succession plan where it's a benevolent dictatorship. Or the other extreme is to have nothing but coalition governments. There is no simple majority anymore. And we have seen this in European democracies. Every government is usually a political uh, coalition government. Even in England, it may likely to happen, not a two-party system. So is the American system of a republic at a federation level and a two-party system likely to sustain in the future with this kind of a diversity? If you look at the Indian example, which is absolutely incredible, 
that each state which is like a country is like Europe, so Germany as a country, there's a state like that, different language, different culture, different di you know, diets, everything is different. If we find now each state dominated by a different party and the national party is not the same. So how do you organize a federation where the majority of the federation is the same as majority in each of the states? Not possible. You're going to see that for more political gridlocks and certain forms of govern governments will emerge in the process. Whether we like it or not, more stable the government of a given country or a region, the better off that country. How will you do it? I, have, don't have, I don't have any ideological angle. I'm just a professor here. I'm just an academic. But I've been watching the difference in the way the governance evolves, politically where evolution happens between, let's say, India and China. China, just like Russia decided, communism as an ideology is dead. Deng Xiaoping made the change, but the change has been very successful succession planning. In fact, Chinese leadership behaves much more predictably than any corporate CEO succession planning today. When you have that kind of a line of sight about where you're going to end up, who will take the leadership role, who will retire out, who will succeed, you get a political stability. And the political stability obviously gives you an economic advantage because capital always flows in into those markets where there is a political stability. And that's the biggest worry I have because in India, today we may have one coalition government, but with one word of no confidence, you may have a second government, as we saw in the last about 12, 13 years since 1991. How do you create political stability? As I said, the only way you create political stability, despite all of the diversity, is primarily to fill the stomachs of the people and their wallets create wealth and create income, then people will keep you in the political power by and large. But that's going to be a challenge. Next major challenge is what I call poor economic infrastructure, not physical infrastructure. Economic infrastructure has several elements. Biggest element is education. Primary school, secondary school, and higher education. Major element around in education is educating both genders equally women and men, boys and girls, both being educated. And some countries will have an advantage, as I mentioned earlier. Communist countries surprisingly have an advantage because when the communism was imposed, surprisingly they mandated that both men and women have to go to school and both will be workers in the factories or wherever they worked, military, industrial, consumer, or agricultural sectors by and large. So we, I do believe that this is a very important area, that economic education, economic uh, you know, infrastructure is education. Second one has to do with patent rights, intellectual property rights. Third one has to do with entrepreneurship. Does a given country or a region nurture more entrepreneurship than the others, which means becoming wealthy is OK? And that's where the differences will come among these three regions by and large. Next one has to do with domestication of international enterprises. You know, we all used to talk and teach. I've done this teaching 35 years about globalization. I'm now beginning to realize that the world, as it becomes more global, is actually becoming more regional and more local. In fact, Honda Corporation created a phrase that became the watchword, think global, act local. I'm not so sure even that's likely to happen. I think the phenomenon is such that a corporation to behave and be respected and liked and uh, sort of welcomed in a given economy will have to become as local, culturally sensitive, media-wise sensitive, community-wise sensitive. In other words, it will have to look at more stakeholders than just customers and markets. That's going to be a nightmare because most of these companies don't understand how to treat their suppliers right locally, how to treat the community right, how to manage the media. And you cannot orchestrate that with such diversity happening at a local and a regional level from some corporate headquarters, whether it is in Atlanta or New York or London or anywhere, or London, or, or even for that matter, Mumbai 
or Beijing or Shanghai. All will have to behave the same way, no matter where you are as your corporate headquarters. Second aspect is, has to do with regionalization of domestic enterprises. In other words, if you are an American company, you'll have to create a European Union regional headquarters and an Asia regional headquarters. And certain cities will rise as conglomerates of foreign uh, companies' headquarters. It used to be Brussels in European Union. It has already shifted to London, for example. It used to be Singapore at one time. It is already shifting to Hong Kong a little more, for example, as we become more and more China-centric. Which are those capitals? Tokyo used to be at one time, but Tokyo is basically not there. So we'll have to watch as to which, where the regionalization take place. But we do see, in fact, regionalization of uh, domestic enterprises and, of course, global enterprises putting regional offices there. And the last area and probably the most critical area, which I believe is a major roadblock, is going to be the rise in people's expectations. Today, with instant communication, especially with the internet, but any other communication device, people know what's happening in the rest of the world. Therefore, my aspirations go up more and more. I want to be like them. And given that we are moving away from a monarchy or a feudal system, we always now want to actually aspire and emulate what others get. So we will basically go for more and more aspiration, emulation, imitation, and my expectations will rise greater than what my nation or my family can deliver. And therefore, I will have constant sense of frustration. How do you manage that? As I said, the only way out, in fact, is to create economic miracles in these economies. And by the way, this is not limited to emerging nations. Again, everything I've talked about is equally applicable to advanced countries. There is a rising uh, expectation that the countries cannot meet either in European Union countries or in America or in Japan or in Korea for that matter. So advanced countries are facing the same problems as the emerging nations. The specific nuances will vary among them. So we'll have to watch all these things, in other words, my vision about 21st century being driven by markets and economics into these three regional blocks is, I think, very realistic, very valuable, viable mechanism and probably would be good for the world. And businesses have to understand and participate and hopefully encourage and nurture that rather than become sort of roadblocks, essentially. But there are roadblocks. And we'll have to learn how to manage roadblocks both from a political viewpoint as well as from a business viewpoint. So basically, let me therefore now summarize what we have talked about so far. Contrary to the popular belief, as the world economy is more and more driven by market forces and less and less by ideology, it will result in, surprisingly, regional markets, not global markets, through geopolitical economic integration and alliances within regions rather than between regions. There will be three regional markets, European Union, Americas, and Asia. There will be more trade and investment within each regional region uh, than between the regions. Economic pragmatism, aging of affluent countries, collapse of communism, an increasing level playing field between advanced and emerging markets are responsible for this geopolitical realignment of markets. There will be greater assimilation of cultures and values within the regional economic markets. In other words, European Union of 21st century will be very different than the Europe of 20th century and Europe of 1800s, for example. In fact, it will be very exciting is my view. So there will be more and more culture and value assimilations within the three economic regions. And that will, by the way, will happen. My, my fascination is with Asia, obviously. What if you blend the culture of Japan, China, Taiwan, Korea, India? How does that look like? Very different. Or what if you blend the culture of the America, which is Northern European, with the Latin culture? How does that look like? Another major change. That's what it is. There's an exciting part of the whole thing. It'll become, you know, then, then there'll, be, uh, there'll be more regional assimilation within the region than between regions. This will be facilitated by flows. We talked about 10 flows, such as product, people, money, tourism, services, communication, entertainment, education, 
technology, and military. Military is the one that I did not emphasize earlier. Let me pick it up a little more. Think about European Union, where you have the European military now. Every country's soldiers now participate, and therefore they settle and live, just like in America. America is a federation of 50 nations. As each nation or each state contributes toward the federal or the central government military, they're all military people. They come from different regions, but they get assimilated into the military. So military is a major flow we have to watch. In fact, my forecast is that in European Union, markets will be less homogenized, will be the last ones to be homogenized, Currency is the first to homogenize. The second is going to be military homogenization and, and third assimilation. And the third one is going to be education homogenization, more so than the market homogenization. So this is one that we need to watch. The traditional east-west assimilation through flows of products, people, and money will increasingly shift to north-south assimilation of cultures and values through those flows. Very important point. There are some exceptions to this north-south evolution of markets, especially the United Kingdom. My bet clearly is that United Kingdom going forward will clearly get integrated into the European Union rather than straddle between its loyalty to America, market loyalty, I'm talking about political loyalty, I'm talking about military loyalty, is going to become basically one of those uh, moons around uh, a planet called European Union, essentially. And will be a key, uh, you know, moon, um, a key, 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 key entity. And I think they will actually influence. Same thing about India. We think India eventually will, in fact, get into one of the blocks. But right now, it is very hard to predict. Brazil is the same way, very hard to predict right now. But it's going to happen. There are some exceptions, as I mentioned. The geopolitical realignment of markets will necessitate structural changes in a country's industrial policy, its economic structure, its domestic industry, and its international trade. We already talked about those fundamental changes in each one of those four categories of realignment of nations. This journey in the 21st century toward emergence of regional markets will encounter many obstacles. The biggest obstacles will be domestic entrenched private sector industries political gridlocks, and rising and rapidly rising citizen expectations. In other words, citizen relationship management will become as important as customer relationship management. Very important thing. Politicians will have to learn how to manage the citizen relationships. How do you shape citizen expectations on a proactive basis rather than just respond or exploit to their expectations? It'll come to boomerang on politicians if they don't know how to shape market expectations, in this case, market being citizens, just like we do in marketing, shaping customer expectations through our marketing tactics, by and large. However, the journey has begun, and reaching the destination is inevitable. I'm absolutely convinced that despite all of the roadblocks and all of the concerns and anxieties, this journey is inevitable. It is going to happen. That this century will be Asia century. Last century was America century. And one before that one was the European century. Thank you very much. I hope you have enjoyed. This is a long, long presentation. It is very, very important. There are two reasons why I wanted to do it. First of all, this is not my field of expertise. I became an expert by doing it. I started advising the government of Singapore around 87, 88. Got very much into macro thinking that this aspect was equally important in shaping markets as competition and strategy, where I have done more of my work, and began to therefore evolve and articulate and see the world as it is evolving. I've done hundreds of these presentations to live audiences. Interestingly, I find that most of my forecasts have come true. The radical thought in 1990, in front of very large political leadership audience, that NATO America will be pushed out was a radical thought. Suggesting that European Union will expand into Eastern Europe was a radical thought, for example. That we will have this North America and South America integration was somewhat of a radical thought. 
that China will emerge as a major market. But these are the things that I began to learn over time. And I think it's a very important journey. And I think it's a very important thing for business community to understand what is happening around here. The second reason why this presentation is very important is that as the new economic powers emerge, which is mostly from Asia, there will be some tensions. In fact, I already forecasted that there will be no major war in European Union. United States of Europe, Winston Churchill dream has come true finally. They can't afford to go to war with each other. But Asia is the next hotbed for a major war. And this war may become much more dangerous than any war we have seen because we have a lot of nuclear weapons and we have lots of population. The antidote to this war is to create more economic integrations and between these three blocks to create a more harmonious relationship rather than a confrontational relationship. And that is the evolution that I hope we will all go through and the political leadership of the world will understand that the world can be actually a great place where humans can benefit enormously if the political leadership and the business leadership comes together as a mission to achieve that particular objective. Thank you very much again.